Thank mm-hmm. you. Good evening and and welcome to our Arable Conference this evening. You're all very welcome. My my name is William Irvine and I'm one of the Deputy Presidents of the Ulster Farmers Union. And as such, I'm delighted to to welcome you here. Uh, This conference is being held in conjunction with the Ulster Arable Society and CAFRI. So uh, the... The industry is living through exciting times just at the minute. And uh, there's an ancient Chinese proverb that says, "Me, you, you live in exciting times, but uh, it's a double-edged sword when, when you have issues as seed supply and spray supply. But tonight we're looking and talking about regenerative agriculture, and we'll have three excellent speakers to, to present to you. And uh, it's... It, for the, the first speaker who is Charlie Curtis. Charlie is an owner of Pro- Progressive Agriculture Services, a c- company founded with the main objective to, to promote regenerative agriculture, a reduced input agriculture, and to develop this with the wider farming sector. 
Charlie is an experienced agronomist who works with growers and get, guides them on how they might adapt and, and regenerative strategies in their arable rotations. Now, I'm, I'm going to hand over to Charlie just in a few seconds, but a, the, the way this works, Charlie's going to do a presentation. Anybody that has questions, if they put them in the question and answer tab at the top of their screen, and then, then I will I will see them there and ask ask the questions to Charlie at the end of our presentation. So, Ch Charlie, you're very welcome here. We'll look forward to your presentation. The floor is yours. Oh, you're, you're you're still muted, Charlie. Okay, dokie. How about now? Can you hear? Yeah. And can you see yeah, my slides? Yeah. All good. The slides are good as well. Fantastic. Um, so, first of all, of course, thank you very much for having me this evening. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, my part of this session is going to be talking, uh, introducing you to regenerative agriculture. We're going to highlight to you why it's really time to start looking at this now and how about we starting on it. So why start? Well, to be honest, we're going to start to need to produce more nutritious food with less, and that's less land, less input, less actives, whilst conserving our natural resources, making a profit, reducing our impact on the environment and enhancing our natural capital. And yet, actually, all the while, our climate is changing around us. Sounds like quite a challenge we have on our hands, actually, but it's not doom and gloom. And I agree with William, what William was saying earlier. It's actually really exciting. We're transitioning into a, a new farming era that is incredibly exciting, and it's full of lots of opportunity. But, and there's always a but, we need to face up to what's happening right now. Our climate is changing. Global greenhouse gas emissions are still increasing. And today, we collectively emit around 50 billion tons of CO2 every year. And this is about 40% higher than in 1990. We are now seeing more extremes. We're seeing heat waves, we're seeing droughts, we're seeing floods. And climate change impacts us in the farming community significantly, as these extremes impact not just our businesses, our profitability, and our livelihoods. Now, when I knew I was coming on and doing this, I I had a quick look at the research for Northern Ireland, and it's interesting because it says that the data predicted for uh, the weather for Northern Ireland by 2070 says that your winters could be up to about 3.9 degrees warmer and 25% wetter, and summers could be up to about 4.9 degrees hotter and 38% drier. So basically, we do need to start building a more resilient and a more responsive farming system that doesn't just survive these changes, but thrives in these unpredictable times. And we do need to acknowledge that we are also a large contributor of this issue. So agriculture in, makes up about 10% of the total contributions of greenhouse gas emissions in the UK. So it's not the largest single industry source. 50% of our emissions are CO2, 10% methane, 40% nitrous oxide. And that's the big one. We are the biggest emitter of nitrous oxide. Now, it doesn't steal all the headlines like carbon dioxide, and it's not as quirky and funny as cow burps. But nitrous oxide is a significant contributor to global warming. Its, con its concentration actually has greatly increased in recent years down to human activity, and it's a lot more potent than all the other greenhouse gases. In fact, it's 298 times more potent than carbon dioxide and can stay in the atmosphere for over 100 years. Now, nitrous oxide is released through the atmosphere every time we cultivate our soils, through runoff and leaching of all the fertilizers we're using, and of course, fossil fuel combustion. Carbon dioxide is released every time we turn our soils over, start up our diesel tractor, or start cutting down those trees for land work. Now, we may not be the biggest single industry, but what we do have that others don't is the ability to be able to reduce our emissions through changing our cultivations and operations. So we can get to that net zero position, and then we can start to have a positive impact, as only we can naturally draw carbon down and store it into our earth. And I think that's an amazing opportunity, actually. And with carbon credits on the horizon, it's definitely time to start preparing. Plus, of course, the legislation to reach net zero by 2050, it actually makes sense for us to start looking at this now. So you're sitting there going, Charlie, what is the solution? Well, I'm going to give it to you, basically. We're all standing on it, and it's our soil. We need to start getting our soils back into the conditions that they were pre the Green Revolution. And if I think about it, actually, we probably need to go back even further, back to the point when we invented the mold bore plough in the 18th century. You see, you need to start seeing soils as the most precious asset on your farm. And I know you're all going, no, no, it's my John Deere X9 combine or my Agrifac Condor Endeavor, but actually it's not. I'm sure even the bank managers would tell you it isn't, but it's your soil. 
And the way that we do this is by adopting regenerative agricultural practices and then adapting them to our own individual operations. So what is it? Well, Regen Ag is a system of farming principles and practices that basically increases biodiversity, and that's above ground and below ground. It protects your soil, protects that asset. It builds soil and organic matter, increases organic carbon. And before you say it, yes, none of this is new. Yep. Regen Ag is a new word for something that we've been doing for years and years. Our forefathers were fantastic at it, except back then it wasn't called that. It was just rotation farming, but we kind of got lost along the way. What we do now have is the benefit of that history and that experience, along with the technology we've got and some amazing ag tech. We can actually move forward, I suppose, in a more considered and a more knowledgeable way. And it's not just about protecting that, is that it's protecting our livelihoods. This isn't just an exercise for subsidies or grants. Taking these steps helps us to preserve and regenerate our own businesses. And it actually starts with these simple five principles, which are actually all interconnected and all interdependent. So we'll talk about them. I'll go through these and then I'll show you some slides on what I mean. So to minimize your soil disturbance, you want to maximize on crop diversity. You want to keep the soil covered. You want to cover your assets here. You want to maintain that living root year round, so that's feeding your asset, and integrate livestock. I'm a massive fan of livestock. And, and I've heard a saying today, and somebody said, it's not the meat, it's the method, which we'll look into. So let's look at these principles and see what actions we can take. Keep the soil covered. This is my favorite one. Okay, now I'm starting with this one, and I'm going to focus more on this because I think it's the best principle to start on when you're on the farm. And I found it when I started this journey and started it with others, it's the simplest one to start with. Because of the connectivity of all the principles, when you focus on one, you're almost improving or enabling all the others along the way. Now, I'm guessing you could tell by the fact that I'm itching in my chair and shifting around. For me, soil is amazing. And if you look at this diagram, you look at all these amazing services that it's actually providing us. We don't really acknowledge that or make the most of it. And this is why we need to maintain cover all year round, even when we're not actively cropping. Um, I think I've seen some trials in the UK, an arable that shows a 10% reduction on fertilizer input as you increase your organic matter by each percentage. Increasing your soil organic matter by 0.1% can actually increase its water holding capacity by over 30%, which is going to become invaluable in the extremes of hot days or in floods when we want it to hold a bit more. By increasing that organic matter by 0.1% as well, you're also storing an additional 8.9 tonnes of carbon dioxide per hectare per year. And it goes back to that, that talk I said earlier about carbon credits are coming. So maybe it's time actually to stop seeing cover crops as cover crops, but as cover crops as cash crops. Because not only are they providing all those services, they act as biofumigants, they can scavenge locked in nutrients, legumes can fix nitrogen for free. And the trials show that actually by using nitrogen or nitrogen fixing um, crops, plants in your arable rotation, you actually get a delivery of anything from 75 to 200 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare for the following crop. And my favorite one in this one, and I love it, so this is very nerdy, so I apologize, is the mycorrhizal fungi. So our, 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 our basket of mycorrhizal fungi produce a protein, and it's called glomin, and it's kind of like a glue, basically, that holds all your soil aggregates together, but that prevents erosion. The problem is when you plow deeply, you break up all these fungal chains, and you keep starting from scratch again. So I was thinking, oh, I could have gone on, but actually what I want to do first is say, well, how? How do you get started on that? For me, every time I sit and meet with a farm, we look at the rotation. Where's our opportunities? Where's the gaps? That's finishing there. That starts there. What have we got? What can we use to our advantage? When you're looking at this, don't try and do everything all at once. Start small. Where possible, pick different fields at different stages of the rotation. Have you got the right machinery? Have you got the right resource? What's the following crop? How are you going to destruct it? What's the cost? There's some fantastic people out there who are, who are really experienced in seeds and, and cover crops. And, you know, you've got Paul, um, who's going to talk about that shortly, actually. So it's, and that's a really interesting part of what he's going to talk about, is all of these bits. You've got to define your measures of success. What is it? If you just want to have a zero bare soil, do you need to improve your soil structure? Agree your, agree your metrics before you start, um, and then record it and review it. And the way I say that is because, actually, what we, I do with my farmers is we go out... We dig soil pits. We go and have a look and see how all these things are changing when we've used the cover crops. But it also gets us closer to the soil. It gets us to really understand what's going on. You've got the VES, which is the visual um, assessment that you can use for soil structure. You've got worms. You've got the soil tests that you can get done in labs. 
would absolutely, absolutely advise creating your own score sheet so you can monitor the improvements and the changes over time. And when you're doing your soil test, you're not just looking at things like phosphorus, potassium, and magnesium, but look at all the 12 nutrients. Because actually, as you can see on Mulder's chart, and as we've learned, they're all equally as important, and they're all antagonists with each other. If you've got too much of one, it often causes a problem with the others. Then you've got minimized soil disturbance. Well, you've got mechanical, physical, and chemical here. They all have a negative effect on the soil microbiome, and it actually puts soil nutrient cycling and environmental resilience at risk. You want to limit the amount of disturbance on the soil, maintain that soil structure. Um, I read this fantastic report that said that basically 90% of the nutrients taken up by plant roots are cycled through soil organisms before they become plant available. So virtually everything a plant needs is supplied by these soil organisms that live in collaboration with living plants. Less than one third of the nitrogen fertilizer that we put on the field actually ends up in the plants that are grown there. The rest is retained by other some form of life in the soil, it volatilizes into the atmosphere, or runs off into fields and leaches down below the root zone and into the water movement, which is a problem for a lot of us. Now, I keep minimizing on here. I don't, I'm not sitting here telling everyone to go um, no-till. Don't get me wrong, I think it's a fantastic idea, but I, we have to learn how to get to that process. And some people may not ever be able to. Um, there's actually a chap near me down here in Norfolk who's trying no-till potatoes, and you know, give him his juice fantastic idea. I'm really keen to see how that goes. Um, but there's also things like strip till, min till, or just simply, do I really need to do that cultivation till? Start questioning everything that you're doing. Do I really need to do this? And if I do this, what's the negative impact? There's a fantastic grower. You know, he's an arable farmer in Essex, Simon Cowell. He's prolific on Twitter, if you want to go and catch up with him. He's been no-till for years, and he doesn't even have tram lines in his soil anymore when he processes through. You can see there's nothing there because his soil is in such good condition because he's been no-till for so long. Again, maximize that crop diversity. Well, we've all heard nature abhors a vacuum. But actually, what this is, is different plants release different types of carbohydrates through their roots. And various microbes feed on these carbs and return all sorts of different nutrients back to the plant and to the soil. So by increasing the plant diversity in our fields, we can actually help create a more rich and varied nutrient-dense soil that leads to more productive yields. And how do we do this? Let's cover crops, companion crops, green manures, all help keep the land covered when we're not cropping, but they're adding some diversity. This picture here is actually burseem clover and oilseed rape. Now, they grow very well together. Burseem, though, has a fantastic taproot. It's like a jackhammer, and it can bash through compacted soil. Um, and that mycorrhizal fungi I was talking about earlier doesn't interact with brassicas. So by putting a non-brassica into your mix, it's a way of maintaining that fungal network, which is so important for all of us. Um, keep the soil alive. You want to keep those roots in the soil. You want to maintain the nutrient cycling that's happening there so that by the time you go in with your crop or your cash crop, um, it's already there and it's available and not almost starting cold again. Livestock. Adding livestock to your rotation can bring so many benefits. I started doing this a few years ago on the arable side and, and more recently on the produce that I work in. Firstly, it's a second income to the farm, you know, and, and a lot of the changes that are happening is all about promoting diversity. But secondly, it's all these soil benefits. And yes, I know there's that methane part to tackle, but as we said, that's more about the method than the meat. And actually, these four-legged friends are also four-legged mowing, fertilizing poo machines. And, you know, mob grazing can help manage grasslands, it maintains soil structure, and it can help us with carbon. And so I've nearly finished, <laughs> you'll be pleased to know, but I wanted to finish off just by showing some pictures from where I've been working. Um, and so I, I suppose almost to show some of the challenges that we're up against. So this pictures, these two pictures, the same field. This is June 2017. So that was the beginning of June. We had temperatures over in East Anglia of 36, 37. And by July, we had a month's rainfall in a day. And you could see the structure and what happened to the crop. We couldn't go in it. In fact, we ended up having to write that whole field off because of the state of the field. And then this one, this is um, at the maze last year, actually. You can see those cracks by my, my, beat, my boots. I got a meter ruler and dropped it down, and I couldn't touch the bottom. It was that badly cracked, and that was 38 degrees for a couple of weeks in the summer. With it, though, also came biblical proportions of pests. You can see the amount of aphids on there. It didn't matter what I did. There was no way of controlling it. And then this is my favorite picture. Don't try and boil the ocean. 
don't try it all at once. Okay, there's lots of things to do. And, and, and Regen Ag is a really exciting movement, or isn't it? Re revolution, evolution, whatever you want to call it. But make a plan and keep it really nice and simple. Collaborate, network, get out there. You know, social media is absolutely full of it. There's loads of books. There's fantastic books. There's the English Pastoral by James Rebanks, who, who talks about how his farming has changed in the UK. A lot of the other guys are very much American and Australian. It's okay not to know what it means or to have the answer because there's lots of people willing to get involved and to help you. In my experience, it doesn't always go according to plan. We've all, made, we've all had some challenges, and, and I'm not going to say mistakes because we learn from them big lessons in some cases, um, and it, you don't have to do everything all at once. You know, the, my grand used to say to me, Charlotte, remember, Rome wasn't built in a day, but they were laying bricks every hour, and I think that's absolutely what we need to think about with here. Um, and I suppose my last message is start small, but just start now. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie. That, that, that was fantastic. Was so, that a bit fast? I, no, you're, you're okay. You covered, you covered a lot of ground there, but it, it, it was all good stuff. So, a uh, well, welcome. Any questions now? You just put them into the Q and A box. And uh, the the first one here is Charlie. Uh, what depth of soil are you using as a default when talking about tons of carbon per hectare? That is a default uh, mineral soil. Um, so it's not a high organic matter. Um, although I'm working in some organic fields that at the moment are about forty percent. But we're sticking on to that default at the moment of a regular mineral sort of about 6% organic matter. Just because, you know, there's so many different soil types across our fantastic nation that I think we've all got to start somewhere. So we're all starting with that one baseline. Yeah. And, and the, the next one is, a, I, as well as environmental benefits, how quickly can we expect to see economic returns from, from your a recommendation? Well, I st the sheep was an instant return. Um, and actually, I started using sheep instead of glyphosate quite a lot um, and moving from field to field. And we were getting, I think, yeah, that was a, that was a, a quite a sizable benefit because we weren't having to go out and mow. We weren't having to um, break down car um, using glyphosate. We weren't having to um, destroy many of our cover crops. So we started getting an income on that side of things. Um, but yes, it's a slow process. Um, but I think we've got to start seeing it as something for us to do. So actually I know that I'm investing in my future by doing this on my farm and so that our kids are going to be able to, to carry this on um, and that they've got a future too. Yeah. That answers the question. Yeah, th thank you for that. And the next one's from Matthew Gilbert and he compliments you on, uh, on your great presentation and he wants to know thank the you, name Matthew. of the author from England that you mentioned. You know what, I've got it right here because I've just finished. James Rebanks, he's a shepherd, and it's fantastic because he talks similar to, I suppose, most of us. He's, in, he's a generational farmer. Um, he watched his grandfather farm, his father farm, and him, himself farm. And his grandfather, back in the day, was farming what we would now call regenerative agriculture. Yeah. Back then, it was, as I said, it was just regular rotational farming and, and realizing that you can work with nature, not against it, um, but neither one of them can be in front. Uh, the, 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 next, the next question is, is GWP100 the right model to measure greenhouse gas emissions, given, given that it only measures gross emissions and not the actual level of global warming? Ooh, well, I don't know. I think at the moment we've all got to work to that one. Um, I think carbon is a really interesting story. You know, and I, and I, there's some people selling carbon credits already, and I personally wouldn't, and we're not. Um, I'm absolutely a fan of just getting your ducks in a row first, get your house in order, start looking at your own operations, knowing that these things are happening. Um, but actually, first things first also is do your own carbon assessment. Um, I saw on the advert earlier, you've got carbon um, uh, calculations happening for some areas. Even if you don't necessarily believe or trust or 100% know what's going on, it's always good to get that baseline standard of where you're at anyway and start to see. So, so I use two tools with my guys. We use the Cool Farm Tool or the Farm Carbon Cutting Toolkit. And at the moment, it's just giving us a steer on areas that we've now got to start working on. So we know that actually in one place, because our organic matter is so high, that's actually our biggest emitter. 
Um, other farms, it's absolutely the nitrogen application part of it. Um, and then hopefully, when we're getting ourselves into a better situation on the farm side of things, the policy guys and the mathematicians and all the stuff, you know, will actually come out and start giving us probably a little bit better um, equipment and numbers and guidance on that. Thank you. Uh, that, that's our questions for now. But hopefully, maybe at the end there'll be there'll be more, more questions again. But uh, th thank you very much, Charlie. That that was uh, very informative. Thank you very and, much. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so now at this point, I'm going to hand hand over to uh, Don uh, Morrow, and uh, Don heads up the cereal team within CAFRE. And uh, Dawn's going to, going to introduce our, our next uh, speaker and take it from there. So, Dawn, over to you. Thanks, William. Uh, good evening, folks. Uh, I'd just like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Paul Cotney. Uh, Paul graduated from Queen's uh, in 2017 with a BSc in Ag Tech. Uh, he's grown up on a, on a pig and arable farm, and that has created an interest uh, in cover crops as a, and particularly as a solution to diversifying crop rotations and reducing the dependence on synthetic inputs. Uh, in 2017, he started a DERA funded PhD, looking at the value of integrating cover crops with slurry and the field trials have examined the, those effects on uh, soil chemistry, biology and physiology. So oh, just recently, all the experiments have concluded and the the thesis has been submitted. Well done, yep, and uh, he's he's agreed to come and, and share his findings with us. So, Paul, thank you very much, and I'll leave it up to you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, can I see? Can you see that? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Perfect. All right, so tonight I'm just going to outline some of the trial findings from my PhD project. As Don said, the PhD investigated the use of cover crops, organic manures, nitrogen fertilizers on spring barley yield and uh, different parameters of soil health. Um, <clears throat> the purpose of growing cover crops is to prevent overwinter fallow and reduce the problems associated with that. Is that going through? I'm not sure if that's working. So as Charlie had said, cover crops do have a multitude of benefits. However, cover crops also have a few limitations. These are their costs, the fact that they're sown at the busiest time periods, the variable benefits and uncertainty in nutrient supply to subsequent a commercial crop. At the minute also, we have no subsidies. Um, therefore, in Northern Ireland, to try and enhance the amount of cover crop uptake, they need to be at least profitable or cover their costs. All these limitations are possible to overcome. The best way to overcome some of these problems are if we can find species that um, can store nutrients over winter and prevent the loss of nutrients. If we can improve soil health and improve uh, commercial crop yields whilst using less nitrogen. If this can be, this is possible, this is a step towards regenerative agriculture. Tonight, I am going to <clears throat> focus, uh, I'm going to present some of the immediate effects on soil fertility, as Charlie has done a good job on detailing what can be expected in the biological health and soil physical health. So the pre key project objectives then, were to find species that were best suited to the conditions of Northern Ireland, evaluate the latest sowing date for certain species, investigate if cover crops can respond to additional nutrients from slurry. The high numbers of livestock in Northern Ireland create a multitude or a huge amount of slurries and organic manures. If cover crops could respond to the, the slurries in the form of increased biomass and nitrogen accumulation, this could be a better strategy than applying it to fallow land. Fourthly, it's important to evaluate the effect in spring barley yield. Also, uh, can the nitrogen input to that crop be reduced? So <clears throat> from another uh, experiment, which was a pot experiment, where 17 species of cover crops were grown in response to slurry, 
a subset of a, the best performing species from a range of different families were chosen and implemented into a field trial. The two trial years that the cover crops were experimented in were when they were, were sown on the 14th of August on the back of a drought, where they, that winter was conducive to high amounts of growth due to exceptional conditions, and the spring barley experienced a good growing season. In the year, the next year, this was a completely different story. The cover crops were sown late as, uh, due to the high amounts of rain that fell in August of uh, 2019. Furthermore, that was in a very, very wet winter and experienced the drought uh, during the early growth of the spring barley and then a very wet harvest again. Therefore, the, these are not consistent years, but actually ideal years to test uh, cover crops, especially as Charlie has says, said about the increasing amount of rain over winter that was likely to be experienced in the future. Prior to sowing the cover crops, uh, pig slurry was applied at 35 meters cubed per hectare or 3000 gallons per acre. The slurry supplied 160 kilograms of potassium, 50 of phosphorus, 23 of sulfur, and 263 kilograms of nitrogen. That does not take into account the efficiency coming from the slurry of the, that nitrogen, which would estimate it be around 50%. The cover crops were, were sown, and the species are the tillage radish, forage rape, Phacelia, West Rolls, and Winter Veg. Tillage radish and forage rape are brassicas and were chosen due to their significant response to the application of slurry in that previous trial. Phacelia was chosen as it, it does not uh, conflict rotationally with any commercial crops sown. West Rolls was, was chosen as it is a grass and highly suitable for grazing over winter, and Winter Veg, as this is a legume and should biologically fix nitrogen and improve soil nitrogen availability. This was the best performing uh, legume from that previous trial. Furthermore, a mixture of all were created and a fallow was also incorporated for comparison. The sowing rates and costs are documented in the table. The tillage radish was a high cost of £77 per acre, with the forage rate coming in at a, bit more re a lot more reasonable, £13 per acre. Um, the seed rates were guided by an external uh, seed company, but upon review for the species of tillage radish and phacelia, they could be reduced considerably to save on costs. In commercial practice, uh, typically a mixture uh, would be of cover crops would be sown, to, uh, which provides a lot of different di diversity of species. Another benefit of uh, the mixtures is that it allows overall seed rate cost to be reduced. And by using less of the more expensive species. However, it is important to ensure and be confident that each individual component of the mixture is actually performing and doing what you want it to do. Hence why in this trial, sowing straight species is, is paramount. The cover crops were, um, the biomass of the cover crops was measured at two different time points, which was December and either late winter or early spring. It was divided into its different fractions, which was the above ground biomass, the roots of the the roots of the brassicas, as this is a considerable proportion of their biomass, and also the weeds. Furthermore, soil mineral nitrogen was also measured. The two graphs show the different fractions of the cover crop and the soil mineral nitrogen. Along the x-axis, we have the different species and the treatment of either no slurry or slurry. Um, <clears throat> from the trial in year one, a maximum of 300 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare were, was obtained uh, or was accumulated. Whereas in year two, um, tillage radish with slurry accumulated a maximum of 120 kilograms of nitrogen within its biomass and within the soil mineral nitrogen. To put this into perspective, a spring barley crop requires around 140 to 160 kilograms of nitrogen. Therefore, in year one, we managed to accumulate double what the spring barley crop requires, whereas in year two, that was over 75%. That therefore demonstrates in Northern Ireland that cover crops have a huge uh, benefit and uh, availability to supply the subsequent crop as long as this breaks down sufficiently. 
if we look at the control on the left hand side of each graph, a large amount of weeds grew in year one, it was around 80 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. This is arguably atypical as commercial practice would be, would be usually to destroy this. In year two, there were no weeds grew and therefore demonstrates the benefits of the cover crop and the amount of nitrogen that is going to be lost from the system if they are not sown. Only when the cover crops were sown early was a significant response to the slurry find in the species, including the forage rape and the tillage radish. Uh, turning to um, the soil mineral nitrogen, the blue line documents the level of soil mineral nitrogen found in the control. With the species in the treatments of tillage radish and slurry, uh, phacelia with and without slurry, and the mixture with slurry, all improving the soil nitrogen availability. This was as a result of frost. This picture was taken three weeks post, uh, post measurement, and it shows a phacelia plot completely decimated by the frost. The plot to the left is the tillage radish, which is also susceptible to frost, where these crops are starting to release their nutrients down into the soil profile below. If we look at the forage rape, um, <clears throat> It maintained a very low soil mineral nitrogen and retained the nitrogen within the cover crop biomass as it was not affected by the frost. Therefore, this is a, is a highly advantageous and an environmental benefit too. If we turn our attention to the winter vetch, which was a legume and should biologically fix nitrogen, it should have improved the soil, mineral, soil nitrogen availability. However, this was not found despite it having uh, root nodules capable. This does therefore question the value of the winter vetch or even legumes in this rotational slot over winter. <clears throat> Perhaps we just don't have the conditions necessary to drive the nitrogen production from those crops. So another um, key objective of the project was to evaluate the effect of sowing date on cover crop end uptake. This was a separate trial and used three different sowing dates, which was the 14th of August to encompass the harvest of winter barley, on the 7th of September to encompass the harvest of uh, typically or of a normal harvest, say of winter barley, spring barley, and sown on the 27th of September to encompass a late harvest. When sowing late, species choice is critical. The facilia managed to accumulate 70 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, with all other species uh, accumulating around half of that. Furthermore, the uh, forage rape was completely decimated by pigeons, whereas when sown another uh, earlier, it was unaffected. If we affix the fertilizer price of 80 pence per kilogram, this means the facilia sown at the latest date was worth around 56 uh, pounds per hectare. When sown intermediate on the 7th of September, it was worth £129 per hectare, and when sown early, it was over £200 per hectare. Also note that this is only one nut nutrient shown. Um, they also contain a higher le levels of uh, potassium, uh, phosphorus, sulfur and magnesium, and a lot of other trace elements. Where we found um, increased uh, soil mineral nitrogen, nitrogen availability, it was also found in those same treatments that soil potassium and soil sulfur also increased, showing that the cover crops could improve the soil fertility. So the important question then, well, what's the effect in spring barley yield? So the cover crops were failed to aid destruction and start and increase the increase the rate of destruction or rate of release of nitrogen from the crops. The spring barley was sown and two additional fertilizer treatments was incorporated. That was either a zero rate or 70 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen. The spring barley was then harvested and yielded. This gave four nitrogen strategies within the trial of either no slurry and no additional inorganic fertilizer, no slurry on 70 kilograms of inorganic nitrogen, slurry and zero rate and slurry with a 70. Therefore, the control um, with the zero rate of no slurry and no fer additional fertilizer should have had the lowest yield. The yields for the first year of that trial are shown in the table. 
where the deeper the red, the higher the yield, and the deeper the blue, the lower the yield. It was found <clears throat> in that year, uh, in that August, there was a high amount of overwinter rainfall of 132 milli millimetres of rain, which caused considerable damage to the spring barley crop. This is evident by the fact that the control with the highest rate of nitrogen uh, nutrition resulted in the lowest yield. When the statistical analysis was applied to all the different treatments, we find that there was no significant effect by the different treatments. Um, so what we're observing here is just numeric differences and not significant ones. Again, in year two, the yields for the different treatments are shown. Uh, average yields in that year are much lower as a result of the spring drought experienced in early uh, 2020. Again, when the statistical analysis was applied, we find that uh, species had a significant effect, as did nitrogen, and then their interaction. Looking at the results then, it was only in the Westerwolds without nitrogen that, uh, that reduced spring barley yield. Therefore, this shows that this is an unsuitable cover crop to be used, whereas all the other ones did not reduce uh, yield. So to conclude from the trials then, the yield benefits um, in the first year post cover crops have not been found. There also has been found that <clears throat> the, the cover crops didn't reduce the yields, which is also a good thing. Um, there is also an opportunity to reduce spring barley nitrogen requirement. The weed suppression it has been found. There did consistently improve soil fertility. Um, there is a better efficiency from slurry on the caveat that they are sown early and the correct species is used. They do provide environmental benefits and it is a step towards regenerative agriculture. The take home messages then is two species that complement rotations and machinery to sow early and cover crops can sequester considerable amounts of nitrogen and other plant nutrients. nutrients. Cover crops must be viewed as a means to produce your own homegrown fertilizer that can improve soil fertility, as well as affect soil biology and soil physical health. To conclude, I believe that the cover crops should be subsidized and that the trials do provide concrete evidence. So I'd like to acknowledge um, Lisa Black, Ethel White, Paul Williams, my supervisors, and my sponsor, Deere. Uh, thank you for listening. So. Paul, thank you very much. And we, we, we have a very interesting bit of work and we it has prompted a number of questions. Um, if I could start with the first one, it, it's sort of looking at the, the, the fallow treatment. Can yeah. you maybe give me any, any thoughts on why you think the grain yields were so high in those fallow treatments with no additional nutrition nutrition from either the slurry or nitrogen fertilizer? Yeah. So if I think back to 2018, which was the drought, and um, that whole winter, as I said, was exceptional conditions. There was a high amount of uh, soil mineral nitrogen occurring. Furthermore, with the lower rainfall that winter, we re there was more nitrogen retained in the system. So when it came round to the spring barley growing, se growing season, again, there was more nitrogen about. Um, and that year, the second year then, um, the drought reduced the amount of nitrogen required by the, by the crops. But also I do believe that um, there is maybe more nitrogen coming from the soil than what uh, we would be guided on by current literature available to farmers. Um, especially as in Northern Ireland, we do have high organic matters and that means high total nitrogen contents. Also, even with spring barley too, as the peak nitrogen uptake is later on the season where soil temperature is actually higher, I think the soil has a better capability of supplying at that, that part. So I think that uh, there definitely needs to be a wee bit more research on fertilizer strategies for, you know, like for spring barley anyway. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, the next question here comes from, from Richard. Uh, was work done to determine when the accumulated nitrogen was released to the following spring barley crop? Could the vetch have released the nitrogen after you soil mineral tested? Um, well, from the, well, we looked at the biomass on the soil mineral nitrogen under the vetch, and uh, there was quite a 
there was more weeds produced in the veg than there was actual vet biomass yes. and so that resulted in quite a low amount of nitrogen uh, it just didn't perform well but the species that were affected by the frost is showing that the nitrogen is starting to be released from those crops and the, for the effect of frost is just the can be imitated by early destruction that's the main thing too the main practical pro thing to do with cover crops is to ensure that they're destroyed early and starting to release the nutrients contained and then that means we can start and reduce the spring barley nitrogen requirement um no that's fine um and I mean, are, are, you mentioned some of them, but are there any other practicalities of using cover crops? I mean, you, you've listed some of the benefits and, and, and some of the, the points there, but what are the practicalities of it? I think the, the biggest practicality and the biggest problem in this country is the weather. But as the trials have shown that even in... <clears throat> Good winters, they have a huge potential, and wet winters have also a huge potential to sequester and protect nutrients. Um, but the biggest practicality then is to try and uh, mediate against the sowing date, um, as we can often be delayed. And I think um, to try and rely on phacelia, especially in mixtures or a high proportion, will ensure that that species will perform and will uh, overcome some of the problems. Very good. Uh, another one coming through here, and uh, we'll have to keep it moving quite, very quickly. This, and this is probably the last one. Given the relatively high organic matters in our soils, can we expect a rise in soil health and condition? As you do, I'm assuming that's coming from the cover crops. Yeah. Um, definitely, yes. It maybe mightn't be just in the organic matter. You know, maybe not going to observe that uh, increase to the same extent if the organic matters were much lower. But soil health encompasses both the soil biology, so as my, the microbial side, and the soil, physio, well, soil phys physics. So by retaining, uh, as Charlie said, as by retaining uh, a cover over the winter will mean that the cover crops are uh, accumulating as much light energy as possible and exuding uh, the fuel into the soil to help stimulate the my, uh, microbiome that mightn't be observed in the in the short term but more more in the long term and definitely in our climatic conditions of wet winters there is uh, huge effects on by protecting the soil to reduce erosion and uh, even in improving soil trafficability paul thank you uh Thank you. It's, 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 a, it's a whole, it's a, it's a, I was going to say a new area, and as, as Charlie pointed out, it's an old area, which you maybe have to relearn and apply to some of our new conditions, but your work is very interesting. Thank you very much for, for sharing with us tonight. Thank okay, you. Thank you. And with that, I'll, I'll pass over to Bruce Steele, uh, the chair of Ulster Arable Society, to introduce our next speaker. Over to you, Bruce. Thank you, Dawn, and... Uh... Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Ulster Arable Society, can I thank you for uh, joining in and, and following our, our meeting tonight. I hope you've found it enjoyable and informative so far. Uh, yes, my next uh, tour is a very pleasant one, is to introduce our final speaker for the evening, uh, Mr. David Blacker. Uh, David is from York, and uh, David uh, graduated from Harper Adams Co College with a degree in agri-food marketing before traveling the world for 12 months. On his return, he took over the family farm and contracting business, which is based near the city of York. David is now focused on combinable crops covering over 1,600 acres. He is basis and facts qualified and undertakes his own in-house agronomy. David's farm was one of the first AD AHDB monitor farms. And by the way, can I just uh, thank and acknowledge uh, AHDB sponsorship of David's paper for us tonight. And he was a monitor farm for the three year period there and it was focused on uh, strip tillage, cover crops, improved margins and soil health improvement. Precision farming plays a big part in this business using RTK auto steer, Yara's end sensor and end tester for fertilizer applications, yield mapping and variable rate drilling. David, it's a great pleasure to have you with us tonight. Uh, I believe your presentation is already pre-recorded. Um, so I'm going to ask Heather just to bring that forward to us now and we'll enjoy what you have to share with us. Thank you very much. 
Evening everyone, uh, my name is David Blacker. I'm a farmer and a contractor from the Vale of York, uh, North Yorkshire. Uh, I'm going to do a quick presentation on uh, cover crops. So this is um, how I used to farm back in the old days, probably going back 10 years here. I used to do lots of ploughing, lots of combi drilling, lots of power harrowing. Uh, I found it was very slow, very expensive. It was quite disruptive to my soil and my water movement within the soil. Um, Multiple cultivations were causing some some quite serious structural damage um, in the wrong conditions. Uh, and more often than not, in a dry time, we'd leave it with no moisture for the crop left to grow in. Um, if I over cultivated it to the extent that I had so much loose, fine soil particles there in the field, then I tend to find that the first big downpour we have in the autumn all the soil particles run together and leave the field so it can't actually infiltrate. Um, and surfaces were surfaces of the fields were capping and running together. So we ended up with uh, crops that, and fields that looked a bit like that. Uh, so since 2013, I've moved on to strip tillage. I'm using a Missouri drill. Uh, and it was, it was probably the year before that that I actually started uh, growing cover crops and put them into my rotation. So my current uh, rotation is winter wheat, winter oilseed rape, winter wheat, autumn sown cover crop, and then spring beans. So my motivation really for growing cover crops is to improve the structure of my clay soils. Um, my soil type is predominantly clay loams over clay, um, but they're also there to protect the surface from the winter rainfall we get. And by that I mean the big downpours that really cause some structural issues. Uh, they're also there to prevent the nutrients from leaching out into the water courses. But I'm very much looking at this from a long term soil health point of view. Not, I'm not looking for a short term gain to the following crop. So the first question really you need to ask yourself is why, why do you want to grow them? Because the, the different objectives you may have will change the species mix that you may want to put in there. So you really need to know what you want the cover crop to do for you before you even decide to grow them. Uh, so if you're looking for long-term soil health, you might want species that have got a bit more lignin in them, or a higher carbon nitrogen ratio. If you're looking for a boost to the following crop, then you probably want more leafy growth, lower CN ratio, uh, really packing them out with legumes. So, you, so know what you want to achieve. That's the, that's the first starting point with all cover crops. Drilling dates reasonably straightforward. Really, the earlier you drill them, the bigger they get, and the bigger they get, the more nutrients they capture. So if you really, if you're drilling them late, you just want to make them cheap because they're never going to achieve what what you what you would want them to do when they're drilling in September. If I'm if I'm drilling September, I will choose to drop out some species from my mixture, such as buckwheat and sunflowers, because I know they won't achieve uh, what I would want them to do, and they're, they're they're better off not being in the mix and saving the money and keeping it in the in the bag. Um, and this is demonstrated really by this graph: green area index and drilling date. So you know, if you're drilling early August, you'll get a massive crop. Um, if you're leaving it till se September, they'll be, you know, they'll look a bit bigger than the wheat crop does going into winter. Um, you could also mirror that graph and put um, nutrients captured, a volume of nutrients captured on that same graph, and it would look exactly the same. There's a strong correlation between the nutrients they capture and how big the cover crop is. So, um, so your know, big cover crop will will catch an awful lot more nutrients the bigger it gets. Certain species are certainly better at capturing some nutrients than others. So you, you, if you're looking to capture nitrogen, then your radishes, your clovers, your, your vetches are very effective at doing that. If you're looking at phosphate, phacelia, uh, buckwheat, radish again are good at doing that. If you're looking for potash, then phacelia radish are probably your best bets for that nutrient. So my, my standard seed mixture uh, would be buckwheat, radish, spring oats. These are farm saved spring oats. Facelia sunflowers, uh, and I would I would run that mixture unless it got uh, into September when I dropped the sunflowers and the buckwheat out. Now on the face value of this, if you um, if you look at the cost of facelia, for example, it looks to be the most expensive seed there in the whole mixture. But when you consider how many seeds you get for your money per kilogram, it actually works out very cost effective in that you'll get 50 seeds per square meter costing you £6.25 a hectare, whereas if you compare that to sunflowers, you'll only get five seeds per square metre, costing you a similar amount of money. So even though the sunflowers look cheap per bag or per kilogram, they're actually 
you, you actually need to think about what you get for the money. Uh, I used to I used to plant a lot of uh, Bersine clover before spring beans, but I had discovered over the years that that was encouraging pea and, weevil, pea and bean weevil to come into the cover crop mixture that would then feed on the Bersine clover. And I would have a, a big problem with pea and bean weevil in my bean crop following any mixture that had Bersine clover in it. I'd kind of pre-populated my fields with a pest I didn't really want. So I've since dropped Bersine clover out of the mixture. Uh, I'm currently trying one called Gold of Pleasure, which is false flax. It's quite an interesting plant. Uh, and I do tend to buy straights and mix them myself rather than buy in a you know, pre-mixed pre -mixed bag. One of the one of the problems that you see time and time again is when people are buying one of these pre-mixed uh, bag mixtures is they tend to plant them or uh, drill them too deep. So they'll plant them for the depth of the oat or the bigger seeds of sunflowers. Uh, and that's generally too deep for the facelia and the clover. So you'll, you'll, you'll get half the species will come and half it won't. Half of it will be just at the wrong depth. So generally, if you're doing that, planting them shallower is generally better than planting them planting them deep. Uh, so this is a, this was probably a late drilled um, you know, end of August, early September drilled cover crop, and it was only a couple of species in that mix. Uh, but what was interesting about that having a little dig in there is that there was probably more depth on the roots underground than there were uh, in the top above ground. And that's something we don't often see. We all get, uh, we all sort of look at the vanity aspect of a cover crop in that how we, are, we, we tend to look and measure how much above ground biomass there is. And we don't tend to concentrate enough on what the roots are doing underneath. And the roots are doing as much, if not more, than the above ground biomass. So I always try to, to piece together seed mixes that have um, plants that have got different architecture to the roots. So some that go deeper, some that have got fatter roots. Uh, and then you get the best of both worlds from it. They'll, they'll, they'll structure your soil much more if you've got different roots in at different depths doing different things to your soil. Uh, and if you get it, if you do a, a, a meter square cut down and get them tested, uh, you get analysis back like this. So if I translate that for you to what it actually was. Um, so that cover crop had captured 10 tons per hectare above ground biomass, uh, wet biomass. Uh, which dried down to 1.82 tonnes of dried material that would returning to the soil. It had captured 46 kilograms of nitrogen, 21 kilograms of phosphate, and uh, 77 kilograms of potash. So when it comes down to nutrient capture, I mean, you can put whatever species you want in there, that, and some of them will do a better job than others on capturing, but they tend to capture what you've got. Um, so if you look at sort of your own soil nutrient indices, they'll capture what's there. They won't suddenly putting in a, a a certain species that's good at scavenging phosphate, it won't scavenge the phosphate if you haven't got it to start with. So they'll, they'll really capture what you've got in the soil that's available to them. And the bigger they get, the more they will capture. But the important thing to know, so to, to understand, is that they're still your nutrients. These are the cover crops that have gathered all my nutrients, they're still my nutrients. They haven't leached out into the water courses, so they're still available to be recycled and used for my crops going forward. But you do need to be aware, if you let the cover crop of canopy get big, you need you need to have a plan on how you're going to manage that going forward. It's, they're very nice to look at and you, you think they're doing a wonderful thing, but suddenly when it comes to spring and you're faced with um, a drill that can't cope with a lot of trash, uh, you need to have something in place at the start or decide when you're going to um, prematurely kill it so it's at a, start, a size that you can actually deal with it going forward. Uh, heavy land issues. So I've got quite a lot of heavy land, quite a lot of uh, the high clay content, but also high silt content. In autumn 15, we had a really bad few storms that were really damaging to the surface of the soils. Uh, and a lot of them capped. And this was supposed to be a, a first wheat on a clay uh, following a spring bean crop. And we had some real heavy downpours on it, like, you know, three or four inches in an hour kind of thing. Um, and a lot of it just silt separated and it sealed the field up completely. It stopped any water infiltration. Uh, and ultimately killed off the wheat crop. And being a clay and being badly drained, it never dried out enough in the spring to do anything with it with a spring crop. So I followed that in that year with um, a spring sown cover crop and I put different species mixtures right across it just to see really what did best on my kind of soils, uh, if one performed better than the other. In, in all fairness, they all, they were all fantastically good. 
Um, one thing I would say if you're going to do this is don't let your cover crops go to seed. So there, you know, a lot of them got to flower like this, so Facilia got to flower. Uh, and at that point, I destructed it. Uh, and I, in that instance, I went through it with a pasture topper and just mulched it down. If the cover crops are going to seed, then suddenly you lose control of what's happening. You lose control of when these cover crops are going to come up and when they're going to start growing. Uh, and that'll cause you a, a, a problem in later management in your other crops. So, so don't ever let a cover crop go to seed or you lose control of it. So I was really trying to restructure this field that had had all the silt capping and silt separation from it through the winter. And I was trying to improve its, its water infiltration. It's important to understand uh, what's happening in the soil when you're growing a cover crop. And it's also important that you, you, you manage it properly. If the cover crop does its job right, whether you intend it to or not, if it does its job, it will capture the nutrients from your soil. And in doing so, it will leave your following crop potentially deficient in nutrients at the start of its growing, growing season. So you should also con always consider putting some starter fertilizer down when you're planting the following crop. And if you can't do that, you don't have the ability to do that, then uh, certainly manage, manage your applications accordingly. So I would always front load nitrogen applications uh, where a cover crop had been grown before spring barley, for example. I'd front load all that nitrogen so the crop was never deficient in uh, I was replacing what the cover crop had captured. And we'll get those nutrients back eventually, but then they might not be there at the start when, the, when the, your next crop wants them. So water infiltration is really important. Um, worms, roots, they're all helping water infiltration. Uh, so what I'm trying to do with the cover crops is increase increase my soil porosity. That's the gaps, the size of the gaps in the soil. And I'm trying to increase the permeability of, of the soils. And that's how the water flows through the soil. And it's really important that we get that right, not only in the topsoil, but also in the subsoil. And that's where yeah, I was in lots of problems back in the old days where I was ploughing. I was disrupting the permeability. I was creating a layer that the water couldn't get through. So it was getting through the top fine, but as soon as it hit a plough pan, it couldn't. And I'm trying to reverse that and using cover crops as one of the tools to allow me to do that. And it's, in all fairness, it's working really well on the clays. It's restructuring them fantastically well. Uh, but it is the sands now, actually, I have to watch more than the clays because they do have a tendency to soft compact. So the million dollar question, um, when will we get the, new, when the nutrients captured become available? And really, there's no, there is no hard and fast rules in this because there are so many variables involved. It depends on, on the cover crop residue you've returned, whether it's uh, more cellular residue like your leafy growth, that will break down really quickly. If it's tall stemmy growth, got more lignin in it, that's going to take more time to break down. It also depends on the soil's ability to break them down. So how many microbes, what's your microbe population like? And I don't necessarily measure my microbe population per se, although I have done some uh, carbon burst tests uh, that give an indication to what you've got, just not which ones, not which ones of what you've got. Um, but if you've got more microbes, they're going to break down faster than a field that has less microbes in them. And also soil temperature, you know, air temperature, the, the, the weather makes a difference in how fast it will break down. Wheat straw is really hard to break down because of the carbon, high carbon nitrogen ratio. And, and every cover crop you grow will have a carbon nitrogen ratio. And you can get that tested and work it out to give you some indication of um, whether it's going to happen quickly or happen a bit slower. Uh, it's been said that if you left a mature mustard plant in the field to break down naturally on its own, it would take five or six years for a mature plant to do that. So some of these are going to happen quickly, some of them won't happen so quickly, but it's hard to put a time scale on any of it. So final thoughts, um, consider your rotation. That's really important. Um, obviously, I've had, the, I've had the issue with bacine clover in beans. So be careful of putting a legume in with a legume if you've got a legume in a rotation. Uh, but also be wary of having a, a brassica in with all seed rape. So that's like your radishes in with your rape. There can be some disease transmission. Uh, and what we saw in the, um, the AHTB maxi cover crop trial last year showed very clearly that if you, you shouldn't put a cereal before a cereal. So don't put an oat or rye cover crop before a spring barley cover crop, uh, be a spring barley cash crop, because that will knock tons of hectare off your yield of your spring barley. Um, don't spend too much on your seed mixture. You don't have to. There is no correlation whatsoever between the cost of the seed and how well it will grow. A cheap mixture will grow just as well as a, an expensive one. 
Um, I have a plan in mind for destruction. Uh, some people, I, I always tend to go with Roundup. I don't have any sheep. Some people like to roll cover crops down on a frost. Um, sheep work really well. If I had some sheep, I would certainly use them. That's a fantastic way to recycle those nutrients and even better if they're your own sheep. Um, it depends what kind of soil type you have and how wet the soil is, whether that's going to work for you or not. Um, but you need to have a plan in mind um, and knowing what your drill can cope with when you're drilling the following crop. Uh, certainly for me, what works best is leaving six weeks before I plant. Um, I, I've, I've tried all sorts. I've tried leaving three months in destructing cover crops at Christmas. I've tried leaving six weeks. I've tried drilling straight into them on the green, as it's called. Uh, but I found for me, leaving six weeks is, is about as good as um, I can hope to achieve. Uh, bear in mind, I have seen more yield decreases in the following crop than increases because of the cover crop. And I think there's there's a few things happening there. I think some of it's nutritional uh, in that there's a, a lack of nutrients um, available to the following crop because the cover crop's done such a good job. And I think some of it's leaving the cover crop in for too long, uh, not leaving that six week gap to the extent that you suddenly got a lot of biomass um, on the top of your soil and the sun and wind can't get onto the surface of the soil to dry the, to dry the surface out before you plant. And I think in some instances, I've caused compaction because my soil's been wetter than it would have been because it couldn't dry out because of the biomass, um, because the cover crop was there. So just, I mean, these are all things we can manage as long as we know what's going on and we know where the, you know, where the hiccups are along the way. They're both things we can manage and I'd hope to uh, see more, more increases and decreases going forward. But do bear in mind, it, it's not a silver bullet and you do need to have to consider lots of things like your rotation um, in order not to have any any um, slip ups along the way. But by far and away for me, cover crops have way more benefits than they have detriments. So um, I'll certainly be continuing to grow them. Cheers. Okay, David, thank you very much for that. That has been very informative and very interesting and it's great to get it from a practical farming point of view. Uh, just for those of you who are with us, um, David is now live with us. That was a pre-recorded presentation, but David's now available for any questions. And if you'd like to do that, to put some in. What I was going to suggest, because I'm just conscious of time, what I would suggest is that if Charlie and Paul could now come back on stream with us again, uh, on video and on mute, please. And we do have a couple of other questions, which I'll ask uh, I'll direct towards Charlie and Paul, first of all. And then if you have anything more you'd like to bring to Richard, uh, please do. Actually, one, Richard, I'd like to ask you myself, have you seen any difference and had any issues with um, the difference between chopping straw or baling straw <clears throat> in relation to establishing your covers? Have you had an experience of that? Uh, yeah, I, mean, I, I tend to chop my straw all the time. Uh, mm. I don't tend to bail it. I like to get the, the traffic out the field if I can. Um, I've, I've, no, I've never really seen a, a problem with it. Strip tilling, it, it seems to establish fairly well. I have tried. Um, I have tried a couple of times scattering seed on through a standing wheat crop before you cut it. Mm -hmm. So you know, with a, a slug pelleter on a sprayer and, and drive through the crop and, and actually spin it on, um, and that's that works quite well if as long as you time it right with the weather and it rains quite hard after you've done it. That can work quite well. But um, the, the biggest problem with that is having seeds of different size and different weights, because some will fling 24 meters and the little lighter seeds will only go about six meters. So you can get quite uneven germination from that. Uh, but from a chop pot store point of view, I've never, I've never really uh, had an issue with that really. Okay, thank you very much. That's very interesting. Uh, Charlie, question for you. How much removed is regenerative farming from mixed farming systems that have been practiced here in Northern Ireland for generations? I have a mixed farming enterprise with organic matter near 14% with a planned rotation. Problem, problem for us, and it is a general one, is going forward with this whole program is uh, mintil can struggle because of our weather conditions here. Any comments on that or what would you like to say about that, Charlie? Well, I think that's fantastic, actually. I think it's very, very close to regen ag already. Um, and to have an organic matter of that high is already, you know, putting you in a good stead. I'd say the next phase of things to start looking at is actually reducing your synthetic input. Start using your soil. If you've got 14%, have a look at the soil content. What's your CC, your nutritional content, particularly if you've got that mixed 
part of the rotation and actually start to understand, do you need to use all the nitrogen you are? Um, one of the farms I'm working with, they've stopped all starter fertilizers because they realized they didn't actually need it. It was incredible the amount of money that they saved, but also the amount of reduction in nitrogen is, of course, also good for the nitrous oxide part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think uh, if you can't do min till, strip tills always, as, as David was saying, it's really good. So if you are still having to agitate the soil and break down a pan or you know get to that, that layer of soil that you need to plant into, then actually that's the next step option, I suppose, to give that one a try. Okay, thank you. Yeah, very good. Paul, one from you from a gentleman by the name of Andy Doyle, who we all know very well. Andy, it's great to have you with us this evening. You're very welcome. Um, Paul, are there plans to keep these sites that you have in situ to measure the overall impact on soil health, structure and yield potential over time? Unfortunately, there is not at the minute anyway. Um, the only thing that maybe you could go back to is one of the trials was sown by GPS, so the, all those coordinates are there, and you could go back in any number of years to do it. Um, but at the minute, there are no plans, um, unfortunately. But it would be something that would be interesting. Okay, thank you, David. Question for you: Why did you choose false flax for a cover crop? Uh, well, when I've got I've got legumes and brassicas in the rotation already, so that that limits really your species mix. So it's really trying to find anything else that that you can put in there to get some biomass and get a good decent rooting structure that actually doesn't compromise your rotation. Um, so uh, false flax is one, linseed is another. You know, similar kind of species that you can put in there. So we've got really interesting rooting properties, both of them actually um, can put quite a lot of top growth on there. So it's just trying to mix something together that won't compromise what you're growing as a cash crop, um, but has a different root architecture to the other species you're already growing. Okay, thank you, David. Maybe a general question from Ian McMurdy. Has anyone tried intercropping with clover? Is that something any of the three of you have any experience with? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go first if that's okay. Taps. Yeah. Um, no, I have, and the, I must admit the first year it was a disaster. But the second year we nailed it and I think we learned a lot it's about timing and particularly on that and understanding about competition and um, I actually used a micro clover which generally is only supposed to grow to a certain height likes a bit of shade and then when you cut down your cash crop it's sort of still there um, and it was having to learn how that worked actually in the beginning it was quite patchy but by the second year it was fantastic and it really and it really did work but again what we learned was and this is probably something for you guys is that um, clovers and things don't like growing in high organic matter soils unless you inoculate the seed and it suddenly became quite expensive so if we were just sticking a regular seed down it's fine but actually like, um, these like legume likes to go with almost like a little lunch box so you coat the seed in, in this inoculation so it doesn't have to go searching already it's got everything it needed there then it started to grow so lots of lessons on that one okay uh, Paul or David would you like to come in on that I um, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. No. Sorry. I haven't. Um, I haven't into into row crops a clover with anything. Uh, I have tried to grow uh, black medic with spring beans. So that's a clover alongside a clover. So that yeah, you know, that isn't a isn't an issue. It's an issue when you have it before, but not with it. So I have tried doing that, spinning spinning black medic seed, and that again, that's another uh, another crop that grows quite happily in shady conditions. So it'll sit quite happily under. A, under a bean canopy, um, and it was it was moderately successive, successful, but it was also quite expensive as well. So, um, you know, it's very it is very experimental work. Um, one of the research centres near me last year, I knew they had planted uh, strip tilled wheat um, in between stripped tilled clover, um, but I think they did that in a really droughty season, and they found that that actually the clover took most of the moisture out, and the wheat didn't grow so well. So it's uh, again, it, you know, it's very experimental at the minute. There's there's a lot of information going on, and, and I think it's a fantastic. If we can get it to work, it's a fantastic way of you know keeping something growing in the soil and really speeding up the cycling of the nutrients in the roots. Okay. But it's you know getting it right is what we need to do a bit more work on there. Thank you very much for that, David. Uh, just conscious of time, we'll just take another couple and maybe ask you for fairly quick answers on these last couple here. Uh, any cover crops specifically for late sowing? I know, Paul, you've brought some attention to that this evening. Uh, for late sowing, having tried them for three years, we're struggling even to get winter oilseed rip sown. 
Um, Anything you'd like to really specifically suggest for late sewing, Paul? Um, again, it's just, I was just working with the straight species and the facelia was just day and night in comparison to the rest of them. Um, the facelia didn't cost as much as some of the other ones. Um, um, definitely was is something to consider when, when late sewing. Um, also, it when it was sewn early, it was uh, knocked down by the frost. But when it was sewn late, the low or uh, low plant maturity was actually unaffected by the frost. So if you got some good spring conditions, what you got was a wee bit of extra growth. And facility itself is quite easily to break down as low CDN ratio. So it's not going to start and uh, immobilize nitrogen to the next crop. So uh, it's definitely definitely go for something like that there. Okay. Uh, Charlie. I'd say the same, actually. That's my experience too, Facilia, actually. Mm -hmm. Mustard, but I suppose if it's, it's a brassica, so it's always difficult to use mustard in something like a, in, a, in a rotation with OSR, but we've always used that as a fail-safe. If, if we haven't got any options and it's running a bit late, then at least you get good cover. Mm -hmm. David, you've mentioned Facilia in your program as well. Yeah, anything you want to say? Yeah, I would go Facilia spring outs in that, in that situation. What, whatever you're putting in, if it's late, just, just make it cheap. Okay. Uh, just again, a very quick answer, please, from Richard Orr. What is the best cover crop to grow between cereals and potatoes, particularly in relation to nutrient retention, specifically between cereals and potatoes? Um, from uh, from the trials of that I've done, anyway, something like uh, forage rape on the mixture of phacelia. Your phacelia will be knocked out by the forage uh, by the frost, you know, leaving a bit of forage rape to accumulate some of those nutrients. But also, if you do get um, good spring conditions of a good easterly wind, you'll also get that enhanced drying as well. You'll still get a bit of an open can canopy, um, which can be a good thing too. Okay. Charlie? Over here in East Anglia, Ryan Vetch mix is fantastic in between. Um, gets good cover, and then it breaks down quite easily as well before you go in for the potatoes. Mm -hmm. And David from Yorkshire? Uh, yeah, so before I put, I, mean, I, don't, I don't grow potatoes, don't have a lot to do with them really, but if you want something that for nutrient retention, get something in early that's going to grow a big canopy, and that'll, that'll hold up, that'll take longer for it to break down. I would leave, I would not concentrate so much on your leafy, um, you know, your clovers so much for that. I'd try and get some some decent big stems happening sure okay yeah yeah well listen folks thank you um it was been a bit of a whistle stop tour but i think it's been very enjoyable for those of us who have been able to listen into what you've had to share with us this evening and uh i i, I think for me personally what i've appreciated is your enthusiasm from all three of you and what you're doing and what you're how you want to take things forward um, so really, I've been asked to, to wind up the, the session this evening, and I want to say thanks to everyone who's attended. We've had a fantastic response and a great number uh, listening in tonight, um, especially when we're using these new mediums, which are so strange to all of us. But I do specifically, on behalf of us all, want to thank uh, Charlie, Paul and David for their contributions tonight. It's been very worthwhile, very enthusiastic and very informative. Thank you. Thank you. Can I also thank, thank the, the organising committee who have can I just say, have put a massive amount of work into putting this uh, event together tonight. Uh, and in particular, if it's, I know it's a dangerous thing to do to mention particular people, but I would particularly like to mention Robin Bolton from CAFRI, who has been really one, who's linked all the speakers together and done so much work behind the scenes. And then particularly from UFU to Heather Stewart, who has taken charge of all the tech stuff tonight. I'm a total dinosaur when it comes to this stuff. Uh, so um, Heather has really kept us all in the straight and narrow and looked after things very, very well. It's been super, you know, so uh, uh, thank you all very, very much indeed. And uh, as I say, on behalf of UFU, UAS and Capri, uh, we thank you for attending and uh, hopefully you've enjoyed a, a good evening. I think Heather has a couple of final slides to uh, share with us just before we go. But uh, in the meantime, I wish you all a very good evening and a prosperous, healthy and successful 2021. Thank you. Thank you.